On today's episode, I'm joined by our senior ballistician, Jaden Quinlan. And today, we're discussing everything you didn't know about twist rate. We start with a brief history of rifling twist in rifle barrels, and then we discuss how gyroscopic stability actually works. We walk through some of the early ways to measure gyroscopic stability, and we take a look at the actual formula to calculate the gyroscopic stability of a bullet. We talk about the twist rate and its relationship with the bullet in terms of dispersion, terminal performance, and bullet integrity. This is a really deep technical dive on twist rate, and we think you'll enjoy it. I'm Joyce Hornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. You are listening to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in on this episode of the Hornady Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Swerzik, and I have joining me today by popular demand, Jaden Quinlan. Jaden, thanks for carving time out of the day to sit down with me. Yeah, no problem. It's been a little while. It has been a little while, and these episodes generally are so well accepted uh, that we have you on. Not Maybe it's because of you. I, I don't know. I doubt it. I Those that know me would say no. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> maybe it is because of you. Maybe it's not. But for sure, it's the topics and the knowledge that you that you bring to the show uh, that really resonates with our audience because I think a lot of our audience is just hungry for information and they mm-hmm. want to know more and they want to know deeper information. They don't, I mean, you can find a lot of high level stuff everywhere on the internet, but I feel like we've done a pretty good job with your help really making this podcast a source of information that people can trust and to get some pretty darn good technical data whether that be internal ballistics or external ballistics or uh, Ford off or, or whatever it is. And so today, I feel like this is a, a great topic that we should have done weeks ago, months ago, rather. Jeez, it's already August. Yeah. Uh, uh, that this is accepted and understood by most folks at kind of a you know high school level, junior high level. They get it. They understand it. You need twist rate to stabilize things. But let's let's dive a little deeper. Let's talk about the history of spin-stabilized anything Mm -hmm. and then how that has changed and how we measure it. Because I feel like the measurement methods, or the estimation methods rather, uh, have created some dogma around bullet stability Mm -hmm. and the relationship of bullet to twist rate. So... Uh, if I missed anything there, please fill it in. Otherwise, let's jump right into, well, why are we spinning stuff? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Question, why do we need to spin stuff? Well, it kind of starts with the Germans back in like the 14, 1500s time frame. So, so we got multiple grandpas stacked up here back. Mm-hmm. Uh, what they had started to observe was if they put a little bit of rotation or spin on, an, on a bolt, on an arrow... Uh, from like a crossbow or a bow Mm -hmm. that they got better accuracy out of it and so i think as we naturally progressed to you know a a firearm um from from the crossbow or or bow world it's probably natural to assume that hey maybe we should try to spin the little ball we're shooting out of this musket thing yeah and there was a long period where they weren't spinning must you know barrels and no and 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 even after this started you know i think that the first documented case of a of a rifled barrel is the 1500s um there's gaspard kolner uh is a a german from vienna that's kind of noted as putting the first grooves in a rifle barrel which at that time there was no machining as we know it today this was all done by hand and so that's a tremendous amount of work i mean i'd kind of like to try that someday just to understand how difficult that would be you know i don't think you have the time i don't think i do either (laughs) maybe here in a couple decades or something yeah um not so allegedly the the mr colner guy put some grooves in a barrel but they were straight that there's like some argument on whether he had any sort of spiral or, or twist to the grooves he put in or whether yeah. they were just straight. I would argue that there was at least a little bit of a spiral because I guarantee he didn't knock those things out straight. <laughs> as, as a human, yeah, he yeah. had some error. Uh, but not long after that, there's a there's a documented case of spiral grooves ending up in a barrel from uh, Augustus Cotter. Um, the date there's like 1520-ish, so not too long after that. Yeah. Um, and so they... 
observe just like they did with the with the bolt that that they put some spin on with you know the angle of the fletchings or whatever that hey this thing does better it shoots better um so like from that time frame 1500s up into like the 1600s i think it's it's like this new technology that's starting to leak out you know there's a few more barrels that have it in it because again it's all done by hand so you don't have like hey, we made this discovery, you know, like something here at Hornady. We figure out something about a bullet, and now we can implement that to all bullets in the future, right? So that that's a pretty immediate change, and it filters out to the world, and everybody can benefit from it nearly yeah. immediately, where back then, you, that, that wasn't the case. So you see, like, there's some, there's some documentation of, of rifled barrels being used um, in some warfare around that time, like up into the 1600s, but it's just it, not real widespread. Um, with, with those rifled bar- barrels of that era, they're still shooting, they're still shooting a round ball, right? We haven't right. got to the mini ball yet. Yeah, I know we talked about shapes. that yeah, on some prior podcasts, but with that round ball, they would paper patch it. So the ball was a little bit undersized than, than the barrel and they would wrap a piece of paper around it. And essentially that paper press fit into the rifling is what would spin that ball yep. up. And you see all that, you know, through like the revolutionary war in America, um, and even up into the Civil War. Well, the Civil War is really kind of the knee in the curve. Um, that's about the time frame when the mini ball comes out. So the mini ball was was a contribution from some guys in France, um, hence the word mini. That was one of the guys' last names. Mm. Um, but that was 1949 that that came out. So 1849. 1849, yeah, excuse me. Um, the benefit of the mini ball was kind of twofold. One, you didn't need that paper patch anymore. Okay. Because that's just another piece you have to keep on you, right? Yeah. So you already have like a, a container of propellant, you have your musket balls, and then you have to have the paper. Well, if you can pitch one of those requirements, yeah. you know, maybe you can carry more stuff and it's more efficient. It's easier yeah. to use. All easier stuff. to reload for sure. Yeah. So that was a benefit. But also, um, like we mentioned, that conical ogive, we started to be able to influence bullet drag at this time. Um, and all of that is because of that rifling in the barrel. The fact that you spin a bullet. So going from no rifling to rifling is really the reason why we are where we are today. If we, if we did not have the rifling, if we were not imparting spin on bullets, we would still be shooting round musket balls. Mm. I mean, it might be through a custom bolt action with a barrel made by the, you know, the best barrel makers in the world and all that stuff, but you're still shooting a round ball and the accuracy sucks. Absolutely. Um, but why, so, so that's a little bit of the history on, on how we got there. And, and the other crazy thing about the Civil War being, being that, re- really that was the first documented case in like war history, which you, you can't talk about the history of firearms or ballistics without war being a part of it because right. the, that was the driving factor in those early days, you know. We have to get really close because we can't shoot really far, even right. with a musket. And so there's a lot of arguments around the civil war of did did the fact that rifling became more prevalent and accessible to the average infantry soldier did that change the shape of warfare within the civil war or not and some like historians will argue absolutely it changed because it used to be you know we see those old movies where it's like why would they fight war that way it's two, standing in a two, line two lines 50 yards apart and then you know the commanding officers says commence fire and it's just like this bloodbath like this makes no sense like right. why would you do that you know um especially for like modern veterans we look back at that and we're like that, that that's yeah. insane yeah um so the argument in the civil war time frame was like did the fact that you could now engage for hundreds of yards not like 50 to 100 with a round ball smooth bore musket did that change the way the civil war was fought or did it not change it and that's why you saw the the level of casualty you did, yeah, you know, the, the civil war is infamous for that. So, mm-hmm. uh, who knows, but interesting points though, for sure. Yeah. So why do we need to, why is there all this benefit from spinning a bullet might be, might be the, the overarching question. Um, and that is because as we get into that mini ball era and, and on into where we sit today, modern day with projectile design, we started giving them longer noses, to reduce the drag, we started giving them boat tails. We started playing with the shape. Well, when you do that and the bullet is fired, especially supersonically, uh, 
you have two things that you have to understand from a stability standpoint. One is the center of gravity location of the bullet, and that's really defined by the shape of it and the mass layout within the shape. Okay. So how much of it is a copper jacket? How much of it's a lead core? How much is it an air gap or something like that? So all those have different densities, and obviously, um, depending on their dimensions and where they're located, that's going to influence where the center of gravity lies. And that would just be the balance point of the bullet. Okay. Makes sense. So that's, that's piece one of stability. Piece two is what's called the center of pressure. Yeah. Uh, now, the center of pressure is defined by a whole bunch of different things. But if we step back for a second and we think about an arrow, an arrow is, is stable. It's not like wobbling all over and flying end over end on the way to the target. And it doesn't have the spin that a bullet has. It might have a little bit of rotation like we talked that the Germans had figured out. Yep. Um, but how is it that an arrow doesn't require spin? And that's because the fletchings on an arrow or the, you know, the feathers on the back end or however you mm. want to think about yeah. it, fletching. Um, that takes the center of pressure of the arrow and moves it behind the center of gravity. So the center of pressure is, this, in, in very layman's terms, is the point on the bullet which, which can change locations. The center of gravity doesn't change locations. That's fixed by the mass and the, and the shape. The center of pressure can change locations based on the speed that, that the object is traveling at, the velocity, uh, and also the air density, how, how dense the fluid is or the air that it's traveling through. Um, if that, that center of pressure could be viewed as like the point at which all of the aerodynamic forces are working through the bullet. Okay. So as it's traveling forward through the air, there's that resistance and drag that we've talked about in detail on, on prior podcasts. If that drag, let's say that drag is working through the center of pressure, if that center of pressure is in front of the center of gravity, it would be, since you're pushing in front of the center of gravity or the point of, say, gravitational balance of the bullet, it's easy for you to be able to tip it over. If, because the force is coming from the front and yeah, the point that, that force is working is in front of the pivot point. Yeah, right? and it's traveling forward. Yeah. Makes sense. If you take that center of pressure and you move it behind the center of gravity, now you're technically pushing behind the center of gravity. You're not going to push it over, if that makes sense. It absolutely does. So, so that's, that's the purpose of like the fletchings on an arrow and the reason why that works. If you try that with a bullet, it doesn't work because the center of, pri- the center of pressure is forward. So the relationship between the center of pressure and the center of gravity really defines the, the stability of a bullet, whether it's going to fly point forward or not, gyroscopic stability. And I'll, I'll try to describe this just verbally. Uh, hopefully it comes off okay. But, and this is using some very basic terms just to, to get the point across. Um, so we have that center of gravity and the center of pressure. Center of gravity is fixed by shape and mass. Center of pressure is in a state of motion. And it's defined by three different things. One is the bullet shape. So we have a bunch of different shapes of bullets, right? We oh, have yeah. very blunt ones. We have super aerodynamic ones like, like A-tip. Um, the more blunt the shape of the bullet is, the more to the rear that will move the center of pressure. Now that's kind of a one and done contribution, right? Cause your bullet shape isn't changing. Right. So, so that part is, is kind of fixed. Velocity is in a constant state of change. As soon as the bullet comes out the end of the muzzle, it be, it begins to slow down and it doesn't stop until the bullet stops. Right. right. Constant, constant state of velocity decay. The higher the velocity is the more to the rear on the bullet, the center of pressure will move. The density of the air, usually that's pretty pretty static when we're shooting. Obviously, it changes environment to environment, but within a shot being fired, it's generally static. Unless you're shooting at really high angles, uphill or downhill, mm-hmm. then you will be, yeah. exp- the bullet will be experiencing changes in air density due to its changes in altitude as it travels to the target. But for the most case, we'll, we'll just talk about flat fire. You know, you're shooting... 100 to 1,000 yards on a flat range. The density of that air is pretty much constant all the way to the target. So that's also fixed, but it has a, a play in where that center of pressure is located. And the more dense that air is, so let's say sea level cold conditions, cold temperatures versus on a mountaintop in the summertime, it, the air is more dense at sea level cold than it is at a mountaintop in the summertime. The more dense that air is, the further to the rear the center of pressure will move. So all of that said, center of pressure moves, the the distance between the center of pressure and the center of gravity could be viewed as maybe like a pry bar. Okay. Okay. And the pivot point is the center of gravity. 
on the bullet. When you use a pry bar, you're using your arm and you have a certain amount of strength, right? The, the strength of the, let's say, arm or the hand grabbing the end of that pry bar is the air density and the velocity. The more dense that air is, the stronger the arm is on the end of the pry bar. Sure. The higher the velocity is, the stronger the arm is on yep. that pry bar. So the reason that a bullet is stable or unstable is is based on that relationship. Is the distance between center of pressure, center of gravity, and then how quote unquote strong the forces are that are acting on to it. To overturn it, yes. So if we spin a bullet, how does that counteract or how does that resist that or counteract the 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 Overturning. the forces acting on the bullet pushing through the center of pressure trying to flip it over and make the center of pressure behind the center of gravity um it's because of angular momentum so we talked a little bit about momentum when we talked about bullet drag sure. um and and the uh, i think in particular the v squared portion of the drag equation but when you impart that angular momentum on a bullet by spinning it, mm -hmm. an, an object wants to, to stay in motion unless acted on by an outside force. It'd be a simple way to think of it as, well, if we don't do anything to that bullet but make it fly forward, there's nothing really resisting it from being tipped over. If we give it rotational velocity, it now has momentum in that direction, and you're trying to change that momentum by flipping it by over. flipping it over would be a very like basic way to think of it as so if we spin that bullet and the faster we spin it the harder it is to tip it over because it has more um uh more angular momentum mm -hmm. to it so that that kind of sets the scene on why you need to spin a bullet yeah so that leads into well how fast do you need to spin a bullet what is sufficient or not um, and, you, and you have a thing called gyroscopic stability uh, or gyroscopic stability factor. It's typically viewed or it's typically um, uh, written as SG. Uh, yeah, shorthand. Yep. Yeah. And so that's an important question. We need to know, is the twist rate in this barrel fast enough for the bullet that's going to be shot out of it? And so back to kind of that history piece, you see this, this evolving version of, of calculating that information. Um, and, and the first one that, that kind of really hit the, the scene on like a large scale and is still referenced today is what's called the, the Green Hill formula or the yeah. Green Hill equation. I think we're all familiar with that as far as anybody that's in the precision world, you've heard of the Green Hill formula. Mm -hmm. So that came, um, out of the 1880s time frame from, uh, George Green Hill. He was at the Royal Military Academy. He was like a, a Royal, uh, Artillery Institute. Uh, there's argument, um, either way, but. Um, he was in England. He was in England, and uh, he's an artillery guy. And so he generated this formula, which would which would predict you know how much twist was necessary for a given bullet that he was testing. Whatever. I believe most of his work was subsonic. Yep. Um. And and you kind of see that in some in so he, in his equation, he takes into account a couple different things. We just described how stability works, right? You have to know the mass layout within the shape. You have to know the shape. You have to know the density of the air. You have to know uh, the velocity that it's traveling at, like there's, there's quite a bit of stuff that goes into this. Bit, yeah. Um, and, and that's not everything. That's, that's just what we've described so far, but the Green Hill equation, um, it essentially has this constant value that is multiplied by the bullet's diameter squared. And then that's divided by the bullet's length. And that ends up giving you the twist rate required. Well, that doesn't seem real descriptive, right? No. But that's what he had at the time. Those were metrics that were available. And if he could wrap this formula around it that made it work, cool. Right. That's better than just a guess. And I know? would think his projectile shape wasn't varying greatly. Mm -mm. No, because he was working in artillery. So th in that time frame, that's when you started to see projectile shapes be modified a lot. So what he was working with were the early day style projectiles. Um, so. There's like this velocity correction in Green Hill, which says if you're below 2,800 feet per second, use this number. If you're above it, use this number. In short, um, Green Hill's formula with, with modern bullets can be off by up to, say, 50% just to throw a number out there. Wow. That's a lot. Yeah. That's a big error. That's a huge error. And the, and, and maybe, maybe a, a point to bring up is the consequences of not having enough twist rate is that the 
the point of impact of your bullet is not going to be predictable very much at all when a, when a bullet comes out unstable. Mm-hmm. So if you get this wrong, you get this twist rate thing wrong for the bullet you're using, the gun's essentially useless. Is the bullet going to come out the end of the barrel? Absolutely. Is it safe to fire internal ballistically pressure-wise? Yeah. None of, none of that's really going to be a concern, but you're not going to hit what you're aiming at. And that, yeah, that's a problem. That's a problem. That's the whole reason we're pulling the trigger in the first place. Yeah, right. So Greenhill, you know, 1880s, uh, did the best with what he could. Um, and, and that formula is kind of used on into, let's say, popular culture-wise or, or uh, as, as a method that anybody had access to. That's the method that's used up into the early 2000s. Yeah. And I would say that even there, there was some rapid progression in bullet design in, you know, that 100 years or 120 years that that Green Hill formula was really used. Uh, it wasn't that dramatic when you look, when you compare bullets of today versus bullets of 25 years ago, mm-hmm. you know, when you look at boat tails, short, shallow angle, O jives weren't super long. I mean, yeah, you had some match bullets and you had the G7 shape, you know, that was, uh, becoming more popular and more bullets were getting stretched out. Mm-hmm. But if you look at bullets from the year 1990 and then compare them to 2015 yeah. even that's such a stark difference yeah right so it was probably one of those good enough things for a long time right yep it was the hornady rapid safe keypad vault offers quick dependable access to your firearm while providing security from unauthorized users the rapid safe keypad vault is constructed of a heavy duty 14 gauge steel housing and thick steel lid for tamper proof security The included RFID watch band tag and RFID decal can be selectively programmed to open this safe and any other rapid safe you own. The rapid safe keypad vault from Hornady Security. Um, That good enough started to end um, probably in that same time frame you're talking, like 90s into early 2000s. Early 2000s, um, Don Miller... Uh, really dug in deeply to the Green Hill equations and uh, as as well as a bunch of other stuff that was out there, including a much more advanced method to, to calculate gyroscopic stability, which we'll get to here in a minute. He kind of took all the information that was available at that time and and generated a new equation that could be used by essentially anybody with some pretty basic information and calculate twist rate much more accurately than Green Hill did. Um, to account for all those things you talked about, the changes in bullets that had, that had occurred over the 100-year span. So I think it was in 2005 that Don Miller published in Precision uh, Precision Shooting Magazine this this formula, which is now known as the Miller Stability Formula. Yeah, I think that's the one, you know, me as an up-and-comer early on in my shooting experience and competitive shooting and stuff, that was this, the standard, was mm-hmm. the Miller Stability Formula. And if you were going to order a barrel or whatever, you know, went to JBM Ballistics and used the JBM, excuse me, used the Miller Stability Formula. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and there, most of the places you see that have a stability formula available or a stability calculator available uh, are using that formula. Uh, I know Berger has that on their website. You know, there's a couple, like you said, JBM. There's a few places yeah. out there that do applied ballistics. I would assume. Yeah. So so what what did Don Miller do to, to make things better? Well, Don Miller's formula is uh is 30 times m m is the mass in grains of the bullet 30 is essentially a constant for velocity uh we he does not account for the specific velocity or projectile it's kind of important to know because that's dictating the strength of that arm working on the end of that pry bar so that's what that 30 is it's an approximation for velocity around 2800 feet per second is what he built it for so it's 30 times m over your uh, twist rate squared times diameter cubed times length and then length plus length squared is is in there as well all on the bottom end of that equation so it's taking into account your bullet's mass your bullet's length the twist rate and the diameter okay but we're still missing a lot of key aspects there we yeah don't, we don't have mass layout within the shape is it a 160 grain round nose or a 153 grain a tip right very similar lengths vastly different design right so big improvements um from from the green hill equation right but we're still there's still some some meat on the bone there 
with the with the Miller stability formula, we see errors up to you know twenty thirty percent. Yeah, sometimes it's pretty well spot on, and it sometimes can be. Yes, it's, it's not spot on. Unfortunately, you have no way to gauge that. When yeah. you go use that calculator, you don't know is this thing going to predict it very closely, or am I going to be off by twenty or thirty percent? Uh, and and that can be a fairly large margin, a large enough margin that you may order a barrel thinking that you're good. Let's say a a 10 twist 30 cal, well, 20% is going to be two inches, yep. right? So that that could be problematic. Yeah. And I think that lends itself to what we've all seen again. When I think back of me in 2010, 11, 12 timeframe, you go to the Miller stability on JBM ballistics and you, you type it in there. They always give it a fudge factor. Mm-hmm. You know, 1.0 is technically the threshold, but just to be safe, you know, you want to SG of no less than 1.4, I think was always the magic buffer or 1.5, right. but you had to pad it. You had to buffer it a little bit. Right. Right. And that, that tells you that something's not being handled absolutely correctly. Mm-hmm. So there, there's another method, which, which this method w- was, this came out of the uh, studies done by the department of defense in the research labs for DOD. So essentially the the premier the premier areas of really scientific studies on ballistics and and the defining equations that came out of those that's what this is okay so yeah. this is one that is not as easily computable as mm-hmm. a green hill or a miller and that's the problem with it you know the green hiller the more the the miller allow you with very limited information about your bullet and the a length, calculator the diameter the weight yeah. you know things that are commonly available to you and a calculator you can whip that out really quickly the but con- they're wrong. <laughs> the consequence is that there's a lot of error there. Mm-hmm. If you want to get rid of that error, it becomes very computationally heavy, and you need inputs for that equation that you don't have access to. Well, let's talk about those inputs, because okay. this is really what where the rubber meets the road. This is what separates, oh, yeah, this is a stability, but you got to give it a fudge factor of this from the line in the sand. This is the stability factor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So... The, the this equation I'm not going to read it out because it, it's a lot. But you could find it on the interwebs. The the information that you need to plug in to execute this equation is the the projectile moments of inertia. Two two different moments of inertia. Uh, the spin rate. That's that's not too hard to, to gather. The polar moments of inertia are though, or yeah. any of them. Uh, the uh, the transverse or the polar. Are, are not something that's published on a catalog or box of bullets, right? So that's <laughs> no. a difficult input for about to gain. 0.1% and, of and the you population. Ha- and, and to determine that, you have to have the specific shape of the projectile and the mass layout of the components within it to be able to, to get those numbers. Okay. Um, you have to have the air density. Um, that's not too hard to do, right? Mm-hmm. We, have, we have kestrels and stuff like that. Um, the, the pitching moment coefficient or the overturning moment, I don't see that one published on a catalog or anything anywhere. Right. I mean, also don't have that. Right. But that's a required input. Uh, the diameter of the projectile and the muzzle velocity. So if you go back to my, you know, really basic description of of how that stability worked or not, whether the bullet stayed point forward or not, those are the those are the defining areas that dictate whether that's going to happen. So that one's not real user friendly for folks. However, you do have access to it. Um, that's the equation that's executed in the Fordoff program. And and Fordoff does spit out an SG, a gyroscopic stability number. So you do have access to that, but because it's so hard for you to get that information, we've essentially done that for you. It's wrapped up in the bullet file. Yep. All, all of that information is part of it. And so you can do that comparison yourself. You can go take a bullet, take a bullet that's in Fordoff and uh, go look at the gyroscopic stability calculation at the muzzle under a certain set of conditions and then go execute that same thing with Miller's formula and go execute it with Greenhill and you can see you can prove to yourself the level of errors that that you see in those other programs. Interesting. And yeah, that is free of charge too. Fordoff is a free app. If you don't want to use it for your trajectory solutions, you can download it for free and any bullet that's in the library, we have shot over various various different, you know, barrels twist rates, et cetera. Uh, and we've got bullets from virtually all the popular manufacturers out there and you can use it just to get your gyroscopic stability with different twist rates and different environments. Right. Free right. charge. So a question may be, is this one perfect? Um, not necessarily. There, there's probably always going to be some error in the, in the pitching moment coefficient, the overturning moment stuff. Um, but those errors are generally on the order of 10% or less okay. for this equation. 
and we've empirically tested that to validate it. So a lot of a lot of the time, if we're coming out with a new bullet, you know, especially these modern ones, which are in general longer and heavier and more aerodynamic and and twist rate uh, requirements need to be known by the user. We publish that information. You know, you pick up a box of ELD match or tip. A lot of times, you're going to see the twist, the Minimum recommended twist rate. Yeah, the recommended twist rate is on there. Well, how do we determine that? We use this formula, but this formula we just said could have up to about a 10% error in it. That's substantially better than 20 to 30% or 50% of the formulas that came before it. Right. But we go out and we experimentally uh, test this to see, is it right? D- does does it predict what actually happens when we do it? And and it absolutely does. And and some of the really cool things that you observe when you're when you're reaching that limit of stability of, a, of an SG of 1.0. So an SG of 1.0 means that the bullet is gyroscopically stable it'll fly point forward if it's less than that uh, there's a little fudge factor in there where you can be slightly less than 1.0 and the thing will be gyroscopically stable relatively quickly so it might not be as soon as it comes out of the muzzle it's if it's gyroscopically unstable that means the nose of the bullet is going to pick up a very large angle of yaw it's trying to get tipped over right Mm -hmm. so that the center pressure is behind the center of gravity as it picks up that yaw, it starts to slow down substantially faster. Because of drag. Yeah, because the drag goes up. It's flying sideways, you could think of it as. Well, back to how that stability thing worked. One of the aspects of strength of the arm pushing on the pry bar is velocity. So if you dump velocity super fast, then that arm gets really weak super fast, and the thing can, can snap, snap back. back in, is what we usually say. Okay. Um, still unpredictable as far as trajectory goes. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and as you go all the way into like, yeah, this thing's definitely not gyroscopically stable, hundred percent. Yeah. Un- and you get the sideways stuff. impacts on paper. Yeah. Um, and so when we test this, the really cool thing we see is a lot of times what we'll do is we'll start with a known set of conditions that's gyroscopically stable. Let's say the SG in those conditions is, you know, 1.2 to 1.5. And then we will start to approach 1.0. Generally, we wait for like a cold day in the winter time um, because, again, air density is playing into that. So it might be same velocity, same twist rate, everything's identical. But just because the temperature got colder, the gyroscopic stability number is going to drop. So I can test it, let's say, in the afternoon one day, and my SG is 1.2. And then I come out the next morning with the exact same thing. And under those conditions in the morning, the SG is going to be 1.05 or 1.0 or yeah, 0.95. Really on the right? boundary. So I can, I can see what happens as a consequence of shooting in those low SG ranges. And generally what you see is as you, as you start to drop near 1.1, you don't really observe a whole lot. Somewhere between 1.1 and 1.0, that'd be 10%, right? Mm-hmm. That's where you start to see your dispersion will increase big time. So I'll go from shooting, and it's noticeable. This yeah. I'm not talking about like, you know, you're averaging three quarter or one inch groups, and all of a sudden it goes to like inch, inch and a quarter, quarter yeah. or something. No, it goes from like three quarter or one inch groups to like three or four inch groups. When when you're starting to approach that limit, if you continued on and you shot it at lower SGs than even then, when you see the dispersion increase, then things just start to go bananas. You're essentially just starting into the the area where things go wild yeah. and unpredictable. Um, and in our testing of that, we see that most of the time that possible 10% error um, on that that very detailed formula is, is generally less than that. We see it's almost spot on most of the time. So so yeah, again, go go check that stuff out. Yeah. Um, you can get all that in Ford off. Um, but but yeah, when when we go back and we look from a historical perspective, the the putting this the twist rate into a barrel allows us to shoot more accurate accurately. But then as projectiles progress and twist, so twist rate you know became twi- twist in barrels became common around the time frame of the industrial revolution. Right, the mini ball comes out around that time frame, and then machining allows us to mass produce barrels that are yeah. rifled, and then poof, the world now uses rifled barrels. Um, but the, the, in the early days, there wasn't much consequence because all the projectiles were similar in shape. So you, those guys didn't really have to worry about, yeah. is this bullet going to be stable? Cause there was no, this bullet, right? It was, it was just, like, you had bullet. a couple, yeah. right? 
couple molds. And so as we've progressed those hundreds of years and we have such a wide spectrum of bullets that are available now, the the answer of is this twist rate sufficient is very important now. Right on. It absolutely is. And not just from a, is the bullet gyroscopically stable, but is it going to be optimal for mm-hmm. that bullet? Right. And I learned a lot in that history portion, but now as far as the end user listening to this, what's their takeaway? What is what is the twist rate's relationship to dispersion? Sure. Um, so in general, all things being equal, the faster the twist of the barrel, the worse the groups will be. And that's because I think we talked about, was it the One Whole Groups podcast where yeah. we kind of went in depth on dispersion and talked about bullet imperfections and stuff like that? Yep. The faster you you spin those bullets that have imperfections, which all of them do, yeah. um, the more the more exacerbated the the result of that is from a dispersion yeah. standpoint. And the example you used was an out of balance tire. If your yeah. tire's out of balance. The faster you drive, the worse the wa- it gets. Yeah, absolutely, you feel the wobble. And the same thing with a bullet. So the twist rate needs to be sufficiently fast to provide gyroscopic stability in mm-hmm. all conditions. But then from a uh, once, once that's achieved, going faster with the twist doesn't always benefit you. Not always. And again, I caveated that by saying all things being equal. Generally, what we see is uh, we do a twist rate study, right? We get five or six different barrels made with different progressively faster twists. And we test across all those barrels with the same bullets and loads and everything like that. I have seen... Uh, let's let's just say a seven twist barrel outshoot a ten twist barrel. I've seen it happen. Well, what I just said is in opposition to that, right? Yeah. So that's the important part is all things being equal. There's other sources to dispersion, not just how fast you're spinning the bullet, but it is a contributing factor, or it yeah. can be. Um, and you've seen you know evidence of this, like especially in the in the bench rest world, most of those guys are not running a super fast twist rate. Well, why is that? Um, maybe they know, maybe they don't, but over time, you probably have had better results with a twist rate that's a little bit slower than the faster ones. And so naturally, that's where everybody's pursued yep. or what everybody has pursued. Um, so from a raw dispersion standpoint, I would, accept, I would expect when I go do a test and I shoot a faster twist barrel, I keep that in the back of my mind that this thing might not shoot as well as a slower twist barrel, but it can easily be eclipsed by other... Um, Influences yeah, of quality of the rifling, the steel used, right? The, alignment of the chamber with yeah. the bore, um, the in bore clearances, you know, all of that stuff can play can can totally eclipse it. Where yeah. a fast twist barrel can outshoot a slower twist yeah. barrel. Yeah, but just know out there, listeners, if you're building a six five PRC or something, you there's not a bullet out there that needs a seven twist. Right. The standard Sammy one and eight twist is perfectly applicable to all these six five bullets out there, and by going with an excessively fast twist, again, once you meet the, the, the threshold of this bullet is gyroscopically stable in all conditions, once you work past that, uh, you don't always benefit. And again, those yeah. faster spins can also create some implications, one of which could be, could be a slightly larger dispersion. Find the latest shirts, hats, hoodies, and accessories that you see here on the podcast and much more at HornadyGear.com. Yeah, absolutely. Now there could, we have observed uh, drag benefits from yeah, I was faster twist bring rates. that up. You know, that really rigid spin axis has to do something. Yeah, and we, we've seen that mainly with your very, very low uh, drag designs that are that are really heavy for caliber. Um, so An example we, of this would be our 7 millimeter 180 ELD match. Right. You know, that bullet out of an 8 and 3 quarter to an 8 and a half to an 8, mm-hmm. there's a measurable difference in those three twist rates in its drag. Right. Right. Um, so there, there is something to be said there, but the question, you know, if let's say that that follows the trend and the faster twist barrel that gives you lower drag, say by a couple percent or something also shoots 10% larger groups at the same time. So which, which is better? Which one should you pursue? Don't know. Don't but know. Split I, the difference. I will rarely trade off raw dispersion capabilities for any other benefit. Yeah, I agree. It's almost never worth the squeeze. Okay. Um, So yeah, you can, 
you can have that. The other thing you're going to have is changes in spin drift. Sure. Um, the faster the twist of the barrel, the more spin drift you will observe. And the inverse is also true. I mean, that's not generally a major concern no. um, because we have tools for that, but that's yeah. a consideration. It, it will. Well, it could be a concern if the listener or somebody, the shooter, is still using a uh, BC based calculator for trajectory solutions. 100%. Uh, we could talk to that point a little bit. You know, uh, that's something that Ford Off handles really well because it has your actual bullet the actual physical model of the bullet in a file all those pitching moments and all of those inertial moments uh it has all of that in there and if you're using a bc based calculator it, it doesn't have any of that and so it's what's it doing to calculate for spin drift it's essentially doing that green hill formula i'm sorry not green hill miller mm -hmm. um or something very similar to that very basic approximations about your bullet is what's included so bullet length bullet diameter bullet weight type stuff mm -hmm. because it doesn't know anything about your bullet so those are those are i would expect them to have levels of error and have observed it and recorded it um equal to or higher than the miller stability formula has in error for a stability calculation itself yep so you're talking 10 20 30 percent yep and yep. i've I've talked to several high level competitive shooters using, uh, you know, like everybody else seems to be using a Kestrel with applied ballistics on it. And they purposefully put in the wrong twist rate to get their spin drift and their aerodynamic jump numbers to line up with what's at, what they're actually experiencing. Mm -hmm. And that's simply because they're using empirical formulas or approximations, or they can't solve the equations of motion. Right. Uh, so right. that's, uh, another reason, jump on the, the Ford off train if you haven't already. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, we want you to hit what you're aiming at. Um, let's talk a little bit about, so we talked about dispersion and uh, spin drift. Let's talk about bullet integrity, mm -hmm. because that's that's a big one that every manufacturer of bullets who've ever made a bullet, somebody has handled those or, or bought factory ammo in a certain set of circumstances and has seen a bullet blow up, mm -hmm. uh, where it just simply doesn't make the target. What's the twist rate relationship with bullet integrity? Right. Good question. Well, we started to see this from my first interactions with this would have been uh, the the short range bench rest guys that are generally running 22 cal or six millimeter variants. Um, and obviously we see that evolution of projectile availability and design and stuff. The guys that were shooting uh, the heavier end of the six millimeter spectrum are going to require a faster twist. So that's another point to bring up is that a lot of times you'll hear people say, well, it's a longer bullet. It needs a faster twist because it's a longer bullet. Well, that's like maybe partially true, but there's all those other things going on behind the yeah. scenes. So bullet length does not define bullet stability. It's way more complex than that. But right. yes, in general, faster bullets require more longer twists. bullets. Yeah. Longer bullets require more twist, um, a faster twist. But back to that. So the guys are shooting twist rates uh, sufficient to stabilize heavier uh, bullets in that class. And then they go try a lighter bullet and they blow it up. That bullet comes apart in flight. Generally, you see like a gray poof um, and it sounds different, uh, especially if you're shooting suppressed or something and, and you observe it, it'll, it'll sound noticeably different. Um, and that's, that's the bullet essentially coming apart in the air. It's going so fast, it kind of just vaporizes mm -hmm. that the lead does and the, the jacket tears apart and goes wherever it goes. Um, that's really where we started to see it. And, and then as you've progressed into, you know, cartridges that have faster and faster twist rates, because we're coming out with bullets that are longer and heavier and more aerodynamic and require that. Mm -hmm. When you go back to those legacy bullets that were designed around a much slower twist rate, you can sometimes create combinations where you can co have a bullet come apart just simply due to twist rate. Yeah. And there's other things that could make a bullet, you know, sacrifice the integrity. Uh, heat being one of them. You, Heat's a big one. You have high velocity and you have 28 inch barrels. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you can get a bullet to come apart that way. But just from a raw spin standpoint, and the calculation is pretty simple. It's just 720 times your uh, velocity, and then you divide that number by your twist rate, and that will tell, them, tell you how many RPMs you're spinning around. Mm -hmm. And there's kind of a gray area, but as you get to around 290,000 and beyond, you start approaching 300,000 RPMs, I don't care what bullet you're shooting, you could, you could have some problems. Yeah, 
Yeah, outside of monolithics, I mean, monolithics sure. don't have that, you know, two different uh, materials in the projectile. They they typically hold up very well. Um, but yeah, you certainly can. I mean, and, and you go look at, you, you run that calculation on most combinations out there that are standardized. So go to SAMI and they'll have a, a standardized twist rate. And then also velocities that come along with that cartridge, you know, what, what you should be getting within pressure limitation. Mm -hmm. You run those numbers and in very, very rare cases, you might find something approaching 300,000 RPMs or over it, but very, very rarely. And Pretty that's darn for rare. a reason. Yeah, you look at like 22,250 with a SAMI 1 in 14 mm -hmm. twist, for example, or yeah, you know, you see I'm out there with the 1 in 12s, 1 in 9s, but uh, you try to send a 50 grain bullet out of a one and eight, 22, 250, mm -hmm. you're, you're probably going to spin that thing apart. Yeah, absolutely. So that's something to be uh, made note of in regard to RPM. Like we said, there's other things that can cause bullet integrity problems. Absolutely. It, it's a, it's a, there's a multiple points of contribution that, that will yeah. cause a bullet to come apart. Twist rates, absolutely. That's like the bare minimum consideration, right? right. That's step one. Is your, is your twist rate sufficiently fast that it could cause problems? That's that 300,000 RPM-ish range. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the barrel length? Because from a heat input standpoint into the projectile, that plays into it. Uh, what is the condition of the barrel you know, on the inside? So uh, we've, we've been, what, 10, 15 years now into this sport of high-volume, long-range precision shooting where we're not not batting an eye at ripping off 200 rounds in a um, weekend at, in a weekend in 10 shot strings at, in, in 10 shot strings under a clock yeah. so you know there's there's no way to make somebody move faster than to start a stopwatch yeah. um so all those things are obviously negative for uh the conditions inside the barrel and that alligatoring that heat cracking that radial stress that occurs when that pressure is building behind the bullet i mean all of those things are uh, they just add up and can yeah. create a circumstance where you might have a projectile integrity issue, but it's not any one of those's fault, right? So you can take it's maybe a, a different bullet and put it in that barrel and nothing happens. And so it's easy to assume, oh, well, it's the bullet that's the source of the problem. But if you reverse that, you take that bullet and put it in a different barrel, nothing happens. So it's it's those unique yeah. set of component circumstances yeah. that cause like it. You said it's not, typically it's not just one thing. It can be one it thing. It can be, yeah. Uh, and if it's going to be one thing, it's probably going to be RPM or mm -hmm. something along those lines. But uh, one of the more confusing things to me uh, is it could be that your barrel is so excessively fouled and, and heat checked. Mm -hmm. And it can also be that you have a barrel with several, you know, hundreds, thousand rounds on, whatever. And then you scrub that thing down to bare steel. Yep. Uh, this, it's the both ends of the spectrum. There's definitely a happy medium in there. Yep. yep. Uh, I want to talk now about kind of a new thing. Well, no, save that round for later. Uh, I do want to talk about uh, some cartridges, uh, specifically the 22 Creedmoor. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, Horizon Firearms announced, uh, that they are releasing 22 Creedmoor factory ammunition that we're making for them exclusively through them. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you guys are interested in a 22 Creedmoor, check them out, Horizon Firearms. Uh, but anyways, we proposed, uh, and submitted that cartridge to Sammy for approval. Uh, it will be, uh, approved presumably in January. And I want to talk about like that cartridge specifically, because that is a prime example of how the performance window is pretty darn narrow and how and why we submitted a one in eight twist to Sammy mm -hmm. when for the last 12 years or 15 years or whatever it is, the wildcatters have been running six and a half, seven, mm -hmm. seven and a half. So why did we submit to Sammy a one in eight twist and why is it Horizon Firearms building rifles around that one and eight twist. Cause this is, like I said, is a really good example. Right. Absolutely. So the, the eight twist is really the balance point because as you noted, the, the combination of twist rate requirements for the bullet class velocities produced by that cartridge. I mean, a 22 Creedmoor screams a 22 cal bullet. Yep. Um, you've reached a point where you're living in that dangerous territory. If you go to the faster end of the, of the twist rate spectrum for 22 cal, say six to seven twist inches, inches per turn. We should talk cal, cal per rev here in yeah. a minute because that's okay. way more universal and oh. it's a pretty useful tool. Um, but but a six to seven twist barrel, that's going to stabilize the heaviest 22 cal bullets out there. And that's mainly what those guys have been shooting. 90 grain, 88 grain. But you can't look at a 22 cal 
scream and fast cartridge and not want to shoot a coyote or prairie dogs with it, right? I, I mean, do. They are they are perfect for that. A hundred percent. And the projectiles that are intended to be used for those use cases are generally lighter weight, 40, 50, 60 grain projectile Got even 70, 75. Absolutely. So if you take the twist rates that will stabilize the super heavy bullets in all conditions, all the way down to the coldest temperatures at sea level, and you then take and put those 40, 50, 60 grain class bullets through them, you could have integrity issues. And you don't want that, when you when you introduce something as a standardization, you don't want it to have a possible systemic issue tied to it. Well, that could right. be, like that's enough of an extreme case that that could be systemic, meaning most guys out there that that shoot those class bullets in that fast of a twist, going that speed, uh, could have problems. You don't want to have to do that. So what we decided to do was go with the eight twist. The eight twist will stabilize the up to 80 grain class bullets pretty much in all conditions you're going to use it in. You right. know, sub-zero temperatures at sea level. That high density air that's, yep. that makes stability Which is worse. kind of a worst case. If you're at sea level and it's well below freezing, that's the worst case for bullet stability. Right. And there's a lot of guys out there that are that are operating in those environments. The Dakotas, guys hunting coyotes in the Dakotas. Even here in Nebraska, we get sub-zero. But Michigan, Minnesota, all those places, Canada, mm-hmm. Alaska, right? All those places are near sea, at sea level or near sea level type elevations with temperatures that are sub-zero and guys are out using it in there. So we have to make sure it works in those conditions. Yeah. Um, now, the so that eight twist will allow you to, to dabble down into that 40, 50, 60 grain bullet class and not have the integrity issues yeah. that you would have at a six or seven yeah. test. And you still could have some, but you, it's, it's, it's possible because be it's, it's dependent on those multiple contributing factors yeah. we talked about. Yeah. Um, now on the high end class, the, the 88s, the 90 grain bullets, um, the limitation there is going to be tied to the, the air density piece. And essentially, those bullets are going to be applicable in the eight twist down to somewhere around 30 degrees at sea level, around freezing conditions at sea level. Now, again, bullet stability, that gyroscopic stability, is unique to a certain air density. And so technically, if you want to know if your stuff is going to work or not, or I can shoot this bullet in this twist rate or not, you need to go execute the gyroscopic stability equation for that unique use case. Well, both the Green Hill and the Miller don't take into account air density on either one of those really. So I would recommend you use Fordoff. If you have if it's in question, go to Fordoff, run the run the calculation, see if your gyroscopic stability is above 1.0 mm-hmm. um, at the muzzle. If it is, go ahead and try yeah. it. So the and guy the, it gets progressively more stable the further it goes away from the muzzle. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. that's some another kind of uh not dogma but kind of misunderstood uh or yeah, held belief that... Yeah, we could touch on that real quick after the 22 Creedmoor thing. Yeah. Um, so that's why it was... that. That's why it's introduced with that eight twist. But it does... You know, you're, you're starting to hit the extreme limits of I'm pushing bullets at really high velocities, but I have such a wide spectrum of bullets from 40 grain to 90 grain that I need to pick one number, one twist rate that allows me to do all of that. You're hitting the point where you can't make that yep. happen a pretty narrow window yeah i will say from my own experience with the 22 creedmoor pretty darn fun window to look through though be honest with you it's it is to the target right friggin now yeah it's fast it's flat accurate uh yeah it's just uh just (laughs) all the way around it's it's pretty fun again a pretty narrow window but uh one of the things that horizon's done is really push that cartridge so it's not just for coyotes and prairie dogs it it is Mm -hmm. but you can also use it for colon whitetail does for example or you know they're in south texas right so you got south texas whitetail deer are everywhere if they use it for that antelope hunting you know Derek at horizon is dyed in the wool that this is the antelope cartridge for the west because it, it's yeah, so fast probably work pretty good so so flat and and doesn't take much to kill an antelope with a bullet in the right spot so yeah uh, but thanks for explaining that Tested, selected, and fielded by a specialized group within the U.S. DOD, the 6mm ARC is purpose-built to achieve unmatched performance never before delivered from the AR-15 platform. The 6mm ARC is suitable for a variety of applications from personal defense, match shooting, as well as hunting. Designed to meet the demanding needs of the world's toughest critics, the 6mm ARC, a truly advanced rifle cartridge from Hornady. Let's talk we mentioned it here real briefly 
Uh, and you said you'd touch onto it after the 22 Creedmoor. Yeah. So why does the gyroscopic stability increase as the bullet travels downrange? If we go back and think about what I explained earlier, with velocity being one of the contributions of strength of the arm pushing on that pry bar, mm-hmm. as as the velocity is lost, the strength of that arm is also lost. That strength of the arm also comes from air density, and it also comes from projectile shape. But again, those two things are essentially a fixed contribution within a given shot. Yeah, because so the- that bullets to the target. In, you know, almost instantly. Well, meaning that the shape doesn't change. No. So the, the contribution there and the air the density, yeah. right? The one thing that is constantly changing is velocity. So as the velocity is is bleeding off, uh, the strength of that arm trying to tip the bullet over is weaker. At the same time, the rotational velocity of the bullet is not lost at nearly even close to the same rate that the velocity is lost. The velocity is lost fairly rapidly because of all that drag, all that air that it's trying to move out of the way of the bullet. But Mm -hmm. rotationally, spin-wise, there's not much resistance to slow the bullet's spin down, right? There's not a, it's not touching anything besides the little boundary layer of air around it. And so the, the spin rate of the bullet really doesn't lose much at all. I mean, to throw some basic numbers out, a bullet might come out the muzzle at, say, 250,000 RPMs and uh, 2,800 feet per second. Let's say at 800 yards, the velocity is, you know, 1,700 feet per second. Let's say 1,800 for easy numbers. So we've yeah. lost 1,000 feet per second over 800 yards. The spin rate was at 250,000 RPM at the muzzle. And by 800 yards, the spin rate might be, you know, 220,000 RPMs. Wow. So you lost, you know, you lost over a third of your velocity and you lost 10% of your spin maybe maybe you know yep so, so it gets progressively more, more stable. stable that's right that is interesting uh and the last thing i want to touch on in regard to uh twist rate and and this one's less gyroscopic well related to gyroscopic stability but twist rate in general um uh, we're seeing progressively faster and faster twist rates in a wide variety of cartridges mm-hmm. well uh kind of a wildcat cartridge at the time right now of this recording the 86 blackout um, that's something that there's been one in five twist rifles, one in three twist rifles, one in one twist rifles built. And, uh, there's been a lot of talk about spin energy to get a bullet to, to expand. Let's talk about the terminal performance aspects of twist rate, mm-hmm. uh, not just in the eight, six blackout, but in cartridges in general, what is the relationship between twist rate and, uh, terminal performance? Sure. So uh, with an expanding style projectile, so our, our hunting bullet designs, um, those bullets are, are designed so that the nose begins to open, increase, uh, increase its diameter, and then the, the, the jacket material on the ogive begins to peel back into like a, a petal form down along the sides of the bullet, and that increases the frontal surface area, and that's what's essentially transferring the energy into the target. The energy the bullet has when you increase that surface area, you transfer the energy more rapidly. That's where the wound channel gets formed. Now, the the rate of, of rotational velocity of the bullet is going to play into how fast that bullet expands to its maximum diameter. Okay. The faster the bullet is spinning, the more rapidly it will reach maximum diameter. And again, that frontal surface area of the bullet is what's transferring that energy into the target medium so the faster you get to full diameter the faster you start transferring maximum energy potential into the target and and the energy is coming from the velocity and the bullet weight right Mm -hmm. the the you're not really you're not putting more energy you're not gaining energy above mass and velocity by by spin rate you're just changing where the energy is deposited from a length or time standpoint within the the penetration depth right so the faster you spin the bullet the more rapidly it reaches maximum diameter and so it t- essentially it takes whatever wound channel that bullet is probably char- characteristic to produce and it shifts it closer to the impact location mm. because it's reaching maximum sooner okay now we've also seen issues where a gun company will come out with a twist rate that's substantially faster in a legacy cartridge that can create some problems. Hundred percent. The legacy cartridge is loaded with projectiles that were designed to work around the twist rate that that 
cartridge was introduced with, or the standard twist rate for it. When you go modifying the twist rate to something that's existing, you're going to change the terminal performance somewhat. Maybe unnoticeable. The amount of change is imperceptible. But we have seen circumstances where it's 100% perceptible. Essentially, they increase the twist rate so fast in these firearms that now, as that bullet is opening more rapidly due to the faster spinning bullet, it does so much so that the bullet wasn't designed for it and the, the jacket pedals, the copper jacket, break off. The lead pedals that are, that are supporting that copper jacket break off and you're left with a clean slug and it totally changed the terminal performance of that projectile yeah. and cartridge. Presumably in a negative way. Rate, in a negative way because now that bullet is penetrating much deeper than it was designed for because it got to maximum frontal diameter for expansion and then instantaneously disappeared because everything sheared off because it was spinning so fast the bullet wasn't designed to hold on to it at those type of rotational velocities. Now you're left with just a slug that's going to penetrate yeah. deeper. So there are consequences to that. Absolutely. And I've seen uh, back in my days working with you, one of the things that I noted in shooting ballistic gel with I don't know how to put this diplomatically. I'm going to call them non-expanding hunting bullets, like boat tail hollow points. Yeah. Where if you increase the twist rate, that thing would bore a hole into gel before it would tumble or do whatever it did. But uh, shooting boat tail hollow point style bullets uh, from various manufacturers that were advertised as hunting bullets, when you shot them in progressively faster twist rates, they would penetrate deeper before tumbling or fragging out or... or yep doing it was very unpredictable but the faster you spin them the deeper they would penetrate before they did anything whether that would be the nose would rip open or they'd tumble out the side of the block yeah and i i've seen i've seen the consequences of that um in in professional professional capacities with some of the guys that i work with where you know they're running let's say the old 308 right and uh, uh they're using a a non-expanding style projectile due to the nature of their work and uh, they've been running, you know, 12 twist, maybe 10 twist, because that's what a 308 was for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And the they had a given level of terminal performance they would get from that, from those non-expanding style bullets. They would generally go in and begin to yaw after, you know, somewhere between four and eight inches. It's kind of inconsistent, but yep. let's say in that range. And then somebody comes out and says, well, if you go to a faster twist bullet, it helps with, uh, your projectile drag and makes the makes the point of impact more consistent. You know your your dispersion is smaller at at longer ranges at low Mach number impacts and stuff. And so they're like, ooh, I'm going to pursue that. So they go get faster twist barrels because somebody said that it would be a benefit drag wise. They didn't understand that that was going to affect terminal performance as well. And now that bullet is penciling in 10, 12 inches before before yawing. Uh, and there's essentially no terminal performance anymore. And that's a big risk. That's a liability um, yeah. in, in the, the world of, say, law enforcement or military operations. Absolutely. Um, and so that, that example is just to show you that you may pursue, you may go modify twist rate or pursue twist rate for a given reason over here, but don't think it doesn't have other consequences in other areas. Absolutely. Well, that was uh, quite the conversation. Do you have anything left? in regard to twist rate or stability uh, that you, we didn't cover or that I didn't ask? Um, calibers per revolution yeah, is yeah. something that's not uh, widely used in, in you know, the, the industry. In anything, I would, let's say. I didn't hear about it until I started working with you. Yeah, um, but essentially take your, uh, your, your twist rate in inches and divide it by the bore diameter of your barrel. So let's say with a 6.5, that'd be 256. 30 cal that'd be 300 i mean you can divide it by bullet diameter it'll have a little bit of error but it's not that big of a deal um, but essentially what that does for you is normalizes the rate of twist to it's to that specific bullet diameter so it's easy to make comparisons across different bullet spectrums so let's say a you know a 10 twist in a 30 cal would be a 33 calibers per revolution and in a 6.5 the equivalent of that might be an 8 twist it's also 30 you know i'm just throwing numbers out mm -hmm. without whipping the calculator out and doing it um but then you can start to see because it seems so weird that i can shoot a pretty slippery aerodynamic heavy bullet say a 212 eldx or something out of a 10 twist 308 but then 
a 140 or a 147 65 bullet i need an eight twist like that it just seems odd right because yeah. those bullets are fairly similar outside of their diameters right mm -hmm. they have same very similar shapes and all that kind of stuff and similar velocities maybe so why would it be that I have to go to so much faster twist? When you convert it to calibers per revolution, you start to see that normalize oh, out. And then yeah. things make sense on a different level. That's interesting. Yep. Good point there. Um, what else? Anything in regard to twist rate other than do your homework, download the Ford off calculator, it's free, and you can you know, you cross-check your, your stability factors. I, I uh, Back to the, the start, the history piece, I remember reading somewhere that um, one of the like reservations that uh, military commanders had at the time when this is back in handmade twist rate by the German days thing we talked about was that it made the rifles harder to clean, mm. which I thought was so interesting because we, uh, we battle a lot from a technical perspective, guys that uh, end up having problems internal ballistically or external ballistically. And the source of the problem being that they don't clean their barrel because there's, there's sources out there that say, oh, you know, don't, don't clean it, you know, just don't clean it till it stops shooting or, you know, just it gets better if you don't clean it. All these different kind of dogmatic sayings that exist. Yep. Um, but I, I, when I read that, I thought that was funny. I was like, oh, so we, we've been dealing with this for hundreds of years. Hundreds. Well, well before, you know, <laughs> I, I've had to ask guys what their cleaning regimen is and how they do it. And, and Cleaning uh, regimen? Never heard of her. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I thought that was kind of a funny like reference back to, yeah, nothing changes. Nothing you know? new under the sun. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Jaden, I'll tell you what, I learned a lot about twist rate and gyroscopic stability and some of the intricacy of what it takes to actually calculate the true gyroscopic stability equation and then how much more simplified the Miller stability formula and the Green Hill stability formula are. And uh, I'm glad that we carved this one out. I think it's going to be pretty, pretty well received by the listener and again, for the people that had the really good understanding, this is just that technical dive that I think people are going to be looking for. Yeah. And there's probably, you know, there's probably a couple of episodes you could do on it. Um, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. You know, I'm we sure didn't even talk will... about dynamic stability. Right. Yeah. Um, but I'm sure folks will let us know, you know, like in the comments and stuff, they've been pretty good about, it. oh, that's cool, but I wish you would have went into this or that or something. Yeah. So if, if uh, hopefully this is useful for most folks and they learn something and, and it helps them in the future, you know, that's, that's still kind of a... Uh, a resounding question for for especially the hobbyist you know the guy that that is a reloader or a hand loader and he wants to try a different bullet or something and he's not certain if if this is going to be compatible if it's going to work hopefully this information gives that guy a little bit more understanding about how he can determine that and, and what those different methods mean so. yeah and why it may or may not be it's always nice to know the why mm -hmm. and uh in that vein of knowing the why Listeners out there, if you would drop a comment here uh, on the YouTube channel, uh, or if you're listening, send us an email at podcast at hornady.com. Do you guys like the Jaden Quinlan episodes because of Jaden or because of the information? I don't like that question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I'm being, I'm just playing around here. But I hope uh, it's the information. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, Jaden, I appreciate you, like I said, taking time. I know there's a lot of, it's kind of peek behind the curtain as far as Hornady goes, kind of new product season. It is. Uh, internally, you know, we release all of our new products at the NASGW show uh, in late October. And so these months leading up to late October, it's pandemonium because things are getting finalized and finishing touches and uh, on top of all the other projects that you have. So I know you're a busy guy. Yeah. This will be a fun year though. You know, uh, some cool stuff, cool stuff happening. Right on. Well, Jaden, if you don't have anything else, appreciate you coming on the show. Absolutely. Anytime. Guys, hopefully you enjoyed this podcast and you found it pretty darn educational. I know I did. There's a lot to learn about twist rate and how it interacts with your bullet selection. Uh, if you enjoyed this one, let us know, like, comment, subscribe, and we'll catch you on the next one.